What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. It's fucking game day, right? Wait, we're from Wednesday. Tomorrow? Not game day. Tomorrow's game. <laughs> we're really close to NFL kickoff. Tomorrow night is Chicago and Green Bay. That's a good matchup. I like that. There are a couple players in this game who might not do so well, which makes them a trade target. And that's what we're doing today. This is a video I like to release in the beginning of the year to get you a good idea of who the general trade target should be over the first month or so of the season based on early season schedules and a, a number of different factors because at the beginning of the year, it's kind of a shit show in fantasy between figuring out snap counts and depth charts and who's moving up, who's moving down, who is going to be the main guy in a lot of offenses. So we're going to pick out probably five, six, something around there guys that we think are going to be prime sell high buy low candidates for the first month of the season throughout the year. We're going to be doing this video every week. We will be filming it Tuesday night. We will be releasing it Wednesday night for specific trade targets for that week for what we see going forward. But this is just a very general video of, uh, of what we see and uh, what we think the first month of the season is going to play out like. And uh, as always, if you are new to the channel, subscribe, hit that down below. Hit that thumbs up button if you enjoy the video and you can go follow us on Twitter. Our handles will be linked somewhere uh, and we're throwing out a lot of uh, information on both of our Twitter accounts. But we are here. FB God is back in the house. He's got the bunk bed still behind him. He went <laughs> hatless today. He had a comment about him. Um, people can't take him seriously because of the bunk beds behind him, which is why I think he actually took his hat off for the first time ever. Um, Noah, do you have any, any words as, as to the reasoning? No, nah, my, my hat's just mad dirty. And, you know, that comment kind of got to me a little bit. It shook me up a bit, but we're back and we're better than ever. So I knew, it fucking, I knew it fucking rattled you. <laughs> Noah seems a little bit off today. That's why. It's because whoever left the fucking bunk bed comment, really, it got deep into his soul. It's motivation, though. I'm ready. You ready? You ready yeah, to roll? I'm ready. All right, let's do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this off. And this one kind of – let's, let's hit the intro. Love that. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> All right, so I think it's important that we lay the framework first because there's going to be a lot of players missing time. Now, what makes a good sell-high buy-low candidate is maybe players in ambiguous backfields, maybe players who have very hard or easy schedules up front. Maybe some guys are suspended for a couple of weeks or their opponents are suspended for a couple of weeks, something like that. So right now we're looking at a list of guys who are likely going to miss time. And we have Zeke. It's his contract probably will be done by the time you see this with the, you know, maybe the next 48, 72 hours. Uh, Chris Herndon is suspended for four games. We have Melvin Gordon, obviously sitting out. Um, Melvin Gordon is probably going to miss eight games. They have their week 12 bye, So for regular season purposes, he's only going to give you maybe four or five regular season fantasy games. If he ends up coming back to the Chargers this year, Taylor Luan offensive lineman for the Titans an all pro player is going to be out for the first four games, golden Tate, four games, Kareem Hunt. Uh, eight games or 10 games, whatever, eight games. Um, Seattle, Malik McDowell for the defensive line. Also, Jaron Reed is out. Patrick Peterson, Antonio Callaway for the Browns wide receiver. Richie Incognito has a two-game suspension. So those are all the guys that we know for a fact are out. Obviously, they're not going to be in your starting lineups. Now, one guy that will end up being in a lot of my starting lineups, and I really hope I'm wrong about this, but my favorite buy low candidate is going to be Aaron Jones. He is a guy that I touted as a must-own running back for fantasy football this year, and I believe he's going to be the unquestioned starter and the go-to guy in that backfield in Green Bay, which I expect to bounce back in a big way offensively because I think Aaron Rodgers really gets back to the Aaron Rodgers that we've known for so long being an elite player. However, the early season schedule for Aaron Jones is not fun if you're a fantasy owner. Uh, they start off with the hardest defensive schedule you could possibly have. And that's, again, tomorrow, Thursday night football, NFL kickoff. They're at Chicago. Chicago last year allowed the single fewest points to running backs. Uh, their run grade, their, their overall defensive run grade per PFF was number one overall. If you look at the, the first five games of the season, it's at Chicago, Minnesota, Denver, Philly, at Dallas. None of those are favorable matchups for Aaron Jones. 
why I still kind of like Aaron Jones, although like I, you know, it sucks that if you have him, it's going to be tough matchups. I still think he is someone that's very playable because a lot of players fall into a hole where they are game script dependent. If you're getting a guy in the third or fourth round, it's probably because they have flaws in their game. Aaron Jones's flaw was really the fact that he was in a committee and that he's been banged up a lot. But if he's healthy, I think this is the year that they kind of shy away from making that a 50 50 split. So, yes, it might be very tough to produce against Chicago, Minnesota, Denver, but the fact that he's going to be on the field for all three downs, I still think gives you a little bit of hope as a fantasy player. However, the matchups are very tough. So if he gets off to a slow start, don't be worried. Don't be surprised. As long as he can come out of that first month healthy, he's going to be a fantastic target to try to trade for on the low because after week five, he rolls into Detroit, Oakland, Kansas City, the Chargers, Carolina, San Fran, the Giants, Washington. So for like eight straight games, you're getting fucking pillow soft matchups right there. And that's when Jones is going to explode. And uh, it's actually kind of funny because week 15 and 16, it's versus Chicago versus Minnesota. So his fantasy playoffs are actually kind of brutal. So you might actually have like two trade windows for Jones. You might want to trade for him and then trade him away around like week 11 or week 12 after he kind of blows up for eight or nine straight weeks. Then he's got really tough matchups. But by that point in the season – We'll know, one, what the defenses are, you know, because up until like six or seven weeks into the season, it's very hard to get a grasp for how good a real defense is because so many things change between injuries and just turnover. And we just know year over year, defense is very much, it's it's a lot less predictive than offense because offense is usually as good as the quarterback. So as long as the quarterback is in place year over year, we're going to be able to predict about how good an offense is. With defense, you don't have one player that really makes everything go. So that's why defense is tend to turn over in terms of successful rate year over year. Um, So by that time, you know, maybe Minnesota, maybe Chicago aren't the elite defenses that we expected and the playoff matchups look better. But for right now, Aaron Jones, great buy low target because the schedule up front is loaded with tough defenses. But on the back end, you're looking at moi. Yeah, you look at the fact that he plays like all his NFC North opponents who are like all really good run defenses. Even Detroit now with Damon Harrison uh, up front, he faces all of them in the first six weeks. And after he gets those out of the way, it's going to be games that are either high scoring or really forgiving. And the thing I love about Jones heading into this year is in the past, as you said, it's been a full-time committee with Jamal Williams, with Ty Montgomery, and who na- like you name it, like Eddie Lacy was even stealing carries from other guys uh, when he was on the team. So, uh, well, he wasn't as fat back then, so I'll give, I'll give him a pass. Mm-hmm. But, you know, now he's got that three-down skill set, and I'm not even sure if Dexter Williams doesn't have any role in this offense. They're talking about, like, how he's... He's a four now, bro. If anything, it's yeah. Jamal behind him again. Yeah, they were talking about how, like, he doesn't show up to practice and, like, he, he doesn't play hard, whatever. So he's, he's really got the role all to himself. And another big thing to take into consideration is they play tomorrow night on Thursday Night Football against Chicago in Chicago. Probably the best defense in the league, and everybody's going to be seeing Aaron Jones probably running up the gut getting brick walled by the guys that they have up front and that'll stick in people's minds. So a couple of weeks down the line, when he continues to underperform, you could use that window as a buy low. As, as Nick said, you know, stack those really good matchups. And if you want, and you're thinking ahead and if Chicago and Minnesota continue to be elite defenses, maybe ship them off to a team who needs running back help and try to flip them for somebody who does have a really good fantasy playoff schedule. Yeah. I like that. You want to grab one of your guys? Yeah. And kind of on the antithesis of, uh, What's an Aaron Jones is Marlon Mack, you know, a guy who is kind of game script dependent. And this isn't completely because Jacoby Brissett is now their quarterback, right? I know Andrew Luck has gone. And the main reason why we loved Marlon Mack was those, those goal line carries he was going to get because they were going to be in the red zone a whole, a whole bunch because last year with Andrew Luck, they were top five in red zone opportunities and red zone drives per game. Well, now you look at the schedule they have early in the season and this provides a really good buy low or sell high window for him, right? They face the Chargers, who stink against running backs. They can't stop anybody. Um, Tennessee is the only tough matchup, but, again, that's probably going to be a low-scoring game where they might even rely on the run because they're not going to have to play from behind. Um, Atlanta, Oakland, Kansas City, these are all just cakewalk matchups. And even in Atlanta, right, we want Marlon Mack to be a guy who's going to catch a lot of passes. And if you can remember last year, Atlanta couldn't stop any pass-catching running backs out of the backfield. And if Marlon Mack's going to be on the field for most of the game, he's going to catch balls, and that's just going to raise his value because people are going to start to think, hey, maybe he is this three-down back. Maybe he is somebody who can catch passes. I would say you're wrong because we've seen two straight seasons of him not doing it consistently, and that one game shouldn't be an outlier that you use to prove a point that you want to be proven rather than what reality really is. And then after that week, you get to see who he faces. It's Houston, Denver, Pittsburgh, three pretty good defenses. Miami, another cakewalk, but you're going to have to go through three tough matchups just to get there. And then Jacksonville, Houston, Tennessee – 
three more tough matchups, Tampa Bay is a cakewalk, and then New Orleans and Carolina. Basically, every good defense he plays, aside from maybe Tennessee and Jacksonville, has a good offense paired with them, and maybe Denver too, which means not only is he going to not be like efficient on the ground because they're going to stop him up front, but if they're playing from behind, he's going to be taken off the field. You look at last year, his splits when they were leading as opposed to when they were from behind, he only had 49 opportunities in, a, in game situations where they were trailing. Uh, Naheem Hines had 88. So he was basically, I know he played less games, but he was basically being heavily outtouched by a guy who shouldn't really be on the field as much as he was. But it's because he's kind of got limitations in the passing game. Um, I can't speak to his pass blocking because I'm not a PFF expert, but like he's, he's not going to be out on the field for a ton of these games where they're facing tough defenses and when they're playing from behind. And not to mention Jacoby Brissett is now their quarterback who even though he's probably one of the better backup quarterbacks in the NFL, the drop-off from Andrew Luck, who just threw 39 touchdowns last year, to Jacoby Brissett is going to be huge whether you like it or not. And the huge thing that I want to look at is, like, the last time Brissett was there, I know he was brand new to the offense, brand new to the team, and now he has two, three years under his belt, um, and he's been with Frank Reich for that one season. I want to look at the time of possession, right? You look at last year, of the 10 teams, of the top 10 teams in time of possession, seven ranked top 10 in rush attempts, meaning if you hold the ball a lot, you're probably running a lot because running runs the clock down, and obviously that gives you a higher time possession. Of the bottom five teams in time of possession, four of them ranked bottom eight in, pass, in rush attempts, meaning, again, if you're not holding the ball a lot, you're not running a lot. Well, the last time Jacoby Brissett was the quarterback for the Indianapolis Colts, they were 24th in time of possession, which just further takes away from the volume of Marlon Mack. Um, they're not going to be in the red zone nearly as much as they were last year. And I just think after those first five weeks when he is getting those kick matchups, when they probably will be playing from behind against easy defenses as opposed to the second half of the year, um, they're going to have more scoring opportunities. And that's just a great time to sell a guy who really doesn't have a double-digit touchdown floor that we were hoping when Andrew Luck was at the helm. Sam, that was a lot of big facts you just laid out right there. (laughs) I just got one. Marlon Mack, yeah. So I still get plenty of comments, you know, I thought you were in love with Marlon Mack. You know, what the fuck? Why didn't you draft Marlon Mack? I'm like, bro, I like we pivoted as a brand. We pivoted from Marlon Mack as soon as the Andrew Luck calf injury became serious. As soon as Andrew Luck retired, Marlon Mack becomes this fucking hypothetical high upside guy or high floor guy, whatever you want to put it. But he's not a guy when he is on the board, when I'm looking to draft my RB2 or whatever, I just can't seem to hit the button on him because I had never been in love with the talent. The situation was just gorgeous. And you pointed out that early season schedule, the Atlanta, Oakland, KC, it was actually fucking absurd uh, at one point against Atlanta, like the running backs that went against them. You could almost pencil them in for eight receptions a game. It was like – up 117 it, last year, which is like seven and a half a game, which is ridiculous. Yeah, I remember it was like C-Mac was going against him in the end of the year last year and just like – DFS, it's like you could pencil them in for like 14 receptions that game. It, was, it got out of control. So we'll probably see Mac really haul in like a good pass catching load over the first five weeks of the season. I would almost move that trade window down past Houston because I think Houston's defense is going to be way, 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 way worse than they were last year. I mean, they just let go of Clowney. Uh, they don't tire Matthew anymore. They let go of like two or three other free agents. I can't remember. I was listening to a podcast with Evan Silva the other day, and he named like three or like three or four really key defensive players on their team that are not with them anymore. So I think this is going to be a team that goes high scoring on offense, obviously very good on offense and lets up a lot of points on defense. So I think that could also be an, uh, another good game. You look at their matchup last year uh, in week four, it was 34 to 37 uh, week 14, 24 to 21. So there were definitely points being scored. So I think um, Mac might, you can even maybe push yeah, that in the back. playoffs. He tore them up too. I think he went for like 130 yards and a touchdown. So, yeah, so you could probably push that down a little bit um, depending on, you know, where you want to sell them, but definitely Mac is not a guy that I see consistently producing over the course of the season. So if you could sell them at peak value. I am in on that. Now, a guy that would be an interesting flip um, in a perfect world on paper would be the Marlon Mack or Miles Sanders flip because we love Miles Sanders. Or I love Miles Sanders. I actually just took him in the town get down draft last night. The problem is he's obviously going to be in the committee to start the year with Jordan Howard. Um, now, I'm not even really looking at the schedule. This is based off of the fact that we know how they're going to operate in the beginning of the year. We saw it in both. Um, in the preseason games that both of them played together, it was Howard starting one, Sanders starting the other, both getting work with the ones while Carson Wentz wasn't on the field. So we don't really have a clear picture of what's going to happen. Do I think Sanders is going to start off the gate, out the gate with 15 to 20 touches as the Eagles guy? No, I don't think that's going to happen. Do I think that will eventually happen? Yes, because he's way more talented than Jordan Howard is. 
Sanders is going to be he, – he's so versatile compared to the running backs that they've had, right? He makes every one of those, like, just a guy running backs so um, redundant in that backfield, right? Corey Clement, Wendell Smallwood, all of those guys that have, like, you know, if you took the fucking Madden ratings of Miles Sanders and just, like, scooted him down in every aspect of it, that's what Miles Sanders is. And he's got size. He's got speed. He can work on the goal line if they need him to. I'm interested to see how they use him, one, in the pass catching game and on the goal line very early on in the season. The key thing to monitor is going to be the snap counts. That's going to be huge because the general public doesn't monitor snap counts. They just monitor the box score. So what we're going to be hoping for is we want a big Jordan Howard statistical game around week three, week four. Like maybe he rushes in two goal line touches, right, two touchdowns. But we're seeing Miles Sanders slowly start to get the snaps. We're seeing it go from maybe 48-52 to 53-47, 58-42, 65-35. And that's when we're going to start seeing it being in favor of Sanders. And if you're following the snap counts, you'll know that Sanders is becoming the RB1 there. And eventually being on the field, you know, following the snap counts will mean more touches eventually. And you can't always predict the statistics, but being on the field, getting more touches will always in the long run end up being the play there. You know, they drafted him in the second round. They traded a six-round pick for Jordan Howard. I think the proof is in the pudding there. They like Sanders. Everything that's coming out of camp is just that he's the most talented back by far on the roster. You do have to worry about the committee to start out of the gate, but he is someone to target somewhere in those beginning weeks once we see the snap counts go towards Sanders, but we see a big week from Jordan Howard statistically. Maybe he rushes the ball 12 times for 40 yards and gets in the end zone, and you can kind of – um, peel off away from Howard or the fact that, you know, he's stealing goal line touches from Sanders as you're out into getting Sanders on the low. Yeah, it's inevitable that Sanders takes a job for like multiple reasons, right? It's because Miles Sanders has that three down skill set where Jordan Howard doesn't. If you remember back to last year, after two years in Chicago, they're finally hyping up Jordan Howard as a guy who could catch passes. And they tried that out over the first three weeks of the year and it didn't work at all. And when that happens, you don't want a guy in the backfield who kind of like shows your hand to the defense, right? When he's on the field, you know that he's not going to catch a pass and you know they're probably just going to run the ball. With Miles Sanders, that's not going to happen. And in Chicago, when he was their lead back, right, they had trust in him. He's brand new in Philadelphia. What's to say that, sure, they spent a six-round pick on him. If he's just like just as good as he was in, since in Chicago, they're just going to move on to Miles Sanders, a guy who they spent a high pick on, and a guy who can give you value in all aspects of the game, not just being fat and running up the middle for two and a half yards of carry. Yeah, there's this, a lot more to Miles Sanders' game. This is a great fucking offense, right? It's a great offense. And I know I, – I understand that Peterson historically does use running back by committees. But when Jay Ajayi was healthy, right, remember when he got traded for the second half of 2017, he started getting 13, 15, 18 touches a game. When they came into the year, he got hurt immediately. But you saw him being thrown into that workhorse role. He was going to get the 15-plus touches. Josh Adams last year was a guy who, for like a six- or seven-week stretch of the season, was getting 20-plus carries a game. Like, it's not out of the realm of possibilities to see Miles Sanders get 20-plus touches a game for, you know, three quarters or a half of the season or whatever. And that's what you can have as a – that's that's a league winner right there if you get him on a, an offense that's, you know, top five or top three in scoring. And that's something that I definitely see possibly happening in Philadelphia because their offensive line is so strong and they have so many weapons that defenses will never be able to stack the box. Even if Jordan Howard is on the field, they know they're going to run the ball up the middle. You still can't stack the box because you have Deshaun Jackson, you have – J.J. Ortega-Whiteside, you have Alshon Jeffrey, you have, you know, all of these fucking players. So the way I look at it, it's just like, it's just too good of a situation for you to just lean on the running back by committee because eventually it will turn itself towards the talent. That is Miles Sanders. That is why he is a premium by low candidate. Yeah, and a sell high that goes along with him on the same exact team in my eyes is Alshon Jeffrey. And I know he's not like a fancy name and he's not somebody that you're really targeting, but you look at his early season schedule, and he's a guy who could actually like absolutely blow up over the first five weeks. He gets Washington, Atlanta, Detroit, Green Bay, and the New York Jets. None of those are very good defenses. I guess Detroit, they'll probably put Darius Slay on him, which could probably limit his uh, fantasy output. But even if he like performs in three of those games, he catches a touchdown here or there, and he has blow-up games, you're going to be able to flip him pretty high because people still remember those years in like 2013 and 2014 when he was insane, when that was like – five hamstring injuries ago and when he was a lot younger on a t on a completely different team and you just look at not only the la the latter half of the season when he faces at minnesota at dallas at buffalo chicago new uh, new england those are teams that have xavier rhodes byron jones tredavious white chicago's just gonna they might honestly kill carson Wentz that game i'm not looking forward to it and then you know stefan gilmore 
uh, Xavier and Howard. That's probably his easiest matchup is Miami, but they still have one of the best cornerbacks in the league. He doesn't have an easy second half of the season schedule. And paired with this is there's so many young pieces in this offense that they want to get implemented that he's kind of going to be boxed out. And I know he's signed for, I think, 2021 or 2022. So he's not like a prime cut candidate after this season. But they drafted J.J. Arcega or Arcega, Whiteside. Yeah. If, I think he's like from Barcelona or something. That's how they like pronounce oh, it. But yeah. yeah. So they have him who kind of brings like a very similar skill set, like a six foot two, 220 guy who can box out, uh, can win in all quadrants of the field. He's probably going to be getting more run towards the second half of the season, which takes away from uh, Alshon Jeffers' upside. Along with that, Dallas Goddard, who I think he suffered a calf injury, so he might be slowly implemented into this offense. So it might seem like maybe they're not going to run as many two tight end sets early in the year, but you got to remember, he's going to probably be eased in. And this is a team that ran uh, two or more tight ends 40% of the time last year. And if he does start to get on the field a lot more and they do run a one wide receiver set, Who's to say it isn't Deshaun Jackson or J.J. Ortega Whiteside out there um, playing in the one receiver role, which just further takes away from his volume. As we just talked about, Miles Sanders, a guy who can catch passes. If he's going to be taking away dump offs and just overall volume from Alshon Jeffrey, because keep in mind, right, over the past two years, Philadelphia hasn't been targeting the running back position because Darren Sproles have been banged up and their lead backs have been J.J. LeGarrette Blunt, Wendell Smallwood, uh, Josh Adams, just guys who can't catch the ball. With Miles Sanders out there, I wouldn't be surprised if they moved towards – What happened? It's like the dream team back there. Yeah. Honestly, if I could have those guys in like a full court five-on-five five basketball game, I think we could, <laughs> we could do some damage. But no. on a football field, I'd pass on them. <laughs> but um, over the past two years, they've targeted the running back position 14% and 17% of the time, which is well below league average of 21%. So even though they're not going to be the same targets that Alshon Jeffrey is getting because they're going to be like an eight out of like three or four – um, it just takes away from the volume and as, as they move towards a league average rate passing to guys like Miles Sanders and God forbid Jordan Howard. Um, it's just going to further take away from Alshon Jeffrey's upside. And I think he's just a guy you can ship off after those first couple of big games in the beginning of the season, maybe buy low on a guy like T.Y. Hilton and then reap the benefits. Yeah, I like that. Je- Jeffrey's not a guy that's really on my board in terms of even looking to draft from the start, but there is someone in every draft that usually takes him in the seventh or eighth round. They're going to feel good about it in the beginning of the year because that schedule for pass catchers is, is pretty nice out there. And he's got the extra, uh, the extra weapons there to kind of spread the defense out. I mean, like you said, Jeffrey has not, pre- he hasn't gone over 850 receiving yards in like five years now. Jeffrey is nothing like what he was in his prime. I wish we got, I wish he didn't deal with so many injuries because he was a really exciting player at the time. And like to see him in his prime would have been, you know, exciting, but like that, that time is coming past. He is on the, downslope of his career and uh, let him kind of start off hot and see if you can make a move for one of these other, you know, buy low guys that we have on this list. The last buy low guy I have on this list is Cooper cup. And if you've been following me, I am in love with, uh, you know, the combination of Robert Woods and Brandon cooks this year. I'm not in love with Cooper cup because he is coming off this ACL injury, which happened nine months ago. His current ADP is like the fifth round, right? Uh, he tore it in week 11 last year. So that's nine and a half months removed from uh, the start of the season, you know, the first game next week. Now we know that a typical ACL tear recovery is nine to 12 months. And that's, you know, the, if he were 100% recovered, that's at the very earliest stages of that recovery. And that is just the ligaments, you know, that is just within the ACL. That doesn't mean you're at full strength with the muscles, building up the muscles around the ACL. That doesn't mean you're you're at NFL full game speed. So my problem is that I think Cooper Cup, while, you know, everything we've heard is really, really good and uh, encouraging in terms of like his health and him being back on the field and how involved he is in the offense. um, But I still think he is not mentally 100% yet. You know, most players, it's going to take them the second year to get back in order to be their full selves from what they were prior to it. And we've seen reports that they are practicing a lot more in the two tight end sets, which is something that they did not do whatsoever last year. They were the single highest um, rate team in terms of three wide receiver sets. So they ran the 11 personnel 77% of the time last year, highest rate. And that was by a pretty large margin. Now, Cup uh, did avoid the P, uh, the pup list. So he will be suiting up in, uh, in week one. That does not mean he's 100%. Um, so when I think about Cup, it's just like I love him as a player. And I love what he was to this offense last year. I just think guys who tear their ACL midway later into the season are always going to start off a little bit slow. 
So where a lot of people are just like expecting that, you know, five for 75 and a touchdown game week over week over week over week, I think you're going to see Cooper Cup play on like, you know, 50% of the snaps for the first couple of weeks, then maybe 60% of the snaps, then maybe by like week six or eight, he's back up to 75, 80% of the snaps and he won't be a full-time player until they're into the second half of the season. So a lot of people might draft Cup thinking he's 100% because they just see the general reports, but know the trend lines and know that he won't be back to his full 100% snap self until probably the second half. And if you can snag him, you know, close to the second half of the season, understand that he's going to have a lot more time on the field during that part of the year. So Cooper Cup's a guy I'm looking to not draft, but grab him for the second half of the year. Yeah, he might even be a guy you flip Alshon Jeffrey for because in the same yeah. idea of them being injury prone, but Alshon Jeffrey starting off hot and Cooper Cup starting off slow, you can be like, you can leverage your offer and be like, hey, this guy is on an elite offense just like Cooper Cup, but he started hot. We don't know if Cooper Cup's ever going to get better. Flip it, and then you get a guy who over the two years he's been in the league has been just a matchup nightmare because all he does is line up in the slot and burn safeties and burn linebackers that they put on him in an elite offense. And when he's on the field, he's Jared Goff's number one target. And in the red zone and in the deep receiving game, surprisingly, too, um, he's just going to be on the receiving end of a lot of good looks. And I agree with you. He's not a guy who I'm targeting in drafts because his draft price is too high. And I think letting somebody else draft him um, start off slow and then just capitalizing on them getting a little annoyed that their fifth round pick isn't turning out the way that they wanted to is a perfect way to approach owning and trying to acquire Cooper Cup this season. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, we love the talent. I, li I remember calling, I called him the white Keenan Allen when he came out in his draft class and everyone was like, ah, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yo, <laughs> this dude is going to be a dynamite slot receiver. And he is, he still is. But this ACL injury is serious. We have science, we have timetables for it. And he's not going to be a full time player until a month or two into the season. Just know that going into it. If you drafted him, understand that, play him accordingly, but look to buy low second half of the season. Jared Goff coming to his third year for 4,700 yards last year, up-tempo Rams offense. They're going to do the damn thing again. So Cup is a, a buy low guy. Yeah, Jared Goff isn't hitting that seventh, uh, seventh season boost, as I think Mike Mayock said about Derek Carr. But, you know, third season for a QB is pretty good. So I'll take that to boost up. Yeah, Cooper we're on the up and up, and then nothing's changing there in L.A. So we love him. I believe you have one more guy, another fifth-round yeah. wide receiver. It's Calvin Ridley, and Matt Ryan is hitting his 14th-year boost. So I think he's going to be somebody who can really return value this year. And he's another buy low because you look at the schedule they get to face the beginning of the season, right? At Minnesota, Philadelphia, who I know on the chart it says that they're not very good defense, but you got to keep in mind they lost Rodney McLeod. They lost Jalen Mills, who I think is also out this year. Their entire, their entire secondary was yeah. on the timelines last year. Everybody was dead, and that's kind of the reason why they were seventh, along with them being good offense and teams playing from behind in garbage time. But um, at Indianapolis, Tennessee, at Houston, even the best matchups they get here are on the road, and these are games where – he's probably – Calvin Ridley probably isn't going to perform up to where you drafted him because even last year he was kind of inconsistent in games where you expected him to produce, whether it be him leaving early in a game to – I think it was an ankle injury or just him not being, you know, as consistent of a wide receiver you would hope for. But you got to remember, the guy was a rookie and Julio Jones is on the other side of the field who's always going to be the number one target there. Um, and if those in inconsistencies remain into this season, in the beginning of the year, he's a prime guy to buy low because after that game, they get at Arizona, where Patrick Peterson is still suspended. The Rams, which is going to be a high-scoring shootout. Seattle, whose defense, their secondary isn't very good. I know they just added Clowney, but um, I think Atlanta's offensive line should be able to hold them off a little bit. And then the bread and butter, weeks 10 oh, through 50. That, that NFC South, man. They get five straight games in the NFC South. And listen to this little big fact. Last year, when facing the uh, NFC South, Calvin Ridley's average receiving line was five catches. 78.7 yards and 1.2 touchdowns and that's including a game against Tampa Bay where he left after the first quarter and had 37 yards in just one quarter of play so he's Ooh. gonna absolutely eat in four straight games and even if you buy him in like week eight right before his buy you're getting probably a top 15 to top 20 wide receiver pushing you into the playoffs and I know week 16 isn't great but he's gonna be a guy who has high touchdown upside high receiving upside a good reception floor because I, I see him kind of moving into that number two role in Atlanta because even last year, Mohamed Sanu was their number two. But a little sneaky thing is Mohamed Sanu is already 30 years old, and next year he's a $1.4 million cap hit if they cut him, which isn't that much. And we remember the year prior with Devin Funches in Carolina, they kind of faced him out because they knew that he wasn't going to be part of the team next season. Maybe they see Calvin Ridley. Um, 
grow as a player to the point where they're like, hey, maybe we don't need Mohamed Sanu. Maybe we should try to transition him into the true number two in this offense. And if you're getting number two targets from Matt Ryan, across from Julio Jones, who's going to be taking those shadow matchups if they face a guy like Dante Jackson and Marshawn Lattimore in division, Calvin yeah. Ridley is going to absolutely eat for you in the playoffs. And he's one of the best by low candidates you could get if he does underperform at the beginning of the season. Yeah, that's the great part about Ridley because with Julio taking on all those really tough shadow matchups, like typically when you have the wide receiver too, right? It's usually like Tyler Boyd or Juju or someone like that. And you're like, oh, they don't take the wide receiver ones because the guy in front of them gets it. But Calvin Ridley is – like those guys don't really succeed against man or press coverage, right? That's not their strength. But Calvin Ridley is a fantastic route runner and he dominates press coverage and man coverage. So when you get a weaker cornerback and you get to dominate them on the outside – it is such a mismatch. Now, one thing I have pointed out on my channel over the last week or so is that the personnel for the Falcons was a little bit odd throughout the summer in terms of their preseason games. So, Mohamed Sanu was the second wide receiver in two wide receiver sets throughout the preseason. When they went to 11 personnel, Sanu would go into the slot. Ridley would be on the outside. They do run um, 11 or three wide receiver sets or four wide receiver sets a lot of the time. So, it does mean Ridley will still definitely be on the field for 65 75% of the snaps. Um, and that could be another good thing. He might start out off as the, you know, the guy who's not on the field for uh, two wide receiver sets and eventually works his way onto the field. So that could be another slow start or whatever for him. Um, but I think eventually he will win out that role. Um, and, and anytime you can get him on the cornerback too, is just, is phenomenal. And like, you could literally make, uh, and I, I think many championships could be won in fantasy football, just off the NFC South. You, if you just match up players, if you think about Julio, Ridley, C-Mac, Kamara, you could take any of the quarterbacks, I think it'd be fine between Cam, Winston, Matt Ryan. And yeah, unless it's like a minus four per interception league, then I'm not touching Jameis. But other than that, yeah. I don't want to throw Winston in there, yeah. But if you look at it between the players in there and then the fucking guys that they get to play against, that matchup is just so good. But I also wonder if the reason that Ridley wasn't playing in two wide receiver sets is because, you know, he obviously dealt with the hamstring injury. So it's possible that they just wanted to have him on the field for a few of the snaps and let Sanu kind of, you know, take away the snaps that were not meaningless, but like why throw Ridley on the field if he has a higher re-injury risk. So that's something to keep an eye on very early in the season, um, whether or not Ridley is running as a second wide receiver. Um, if he is, that is very, 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 very good because that's what he'll be doing for the remainder of the season. And that's not something that we saw last year. So I actually love that given the schedule that we're seeing right now with the Falcons um, and how easy it gets over the second half of the year. Ridley is definitely a guy that I'm going to be looking to uh, by if I need some wide receiver help at that like six through eight spot, I think. Yeah. Do you want to touch on Le'Veon Bell a little bit? Like probably no like deep analysis, but just yeah, the true. fact that the team has yeah. been talking about – what did you say? Kind of no, no. I said it was a good point that you brought up last week. So, yeah, hit it. Yeah. Uh, there's like rumors about Ty Montgomery kind of sharing the load with Le'Veon Bell. And Le'Veon Bell's on Twitter like, man, I don't care how many touches we get as long as we win a Super Bowl. Breaking news, you're not going to win a Super Bowl. But the thing is they have a bye in week four. So I could kind of see them easing him in over the first three weeks, heading into the bye, and then fully implementing their offense. And along with that, right, Chris Herndon, as, Chris Herndon is out. Robbie Anderson, we're not sure what's up with his calf. So maybe this offense just looks terrible over the first four weeks. And that's just a prime buy low time for Le'Veon Bell because a lot of owners in your league might have had Le'Veon Bell last year and got screwed over by him. Maybe they took another shot on him this year, and they're like, well, this guy's in an RB running back by committee. Uh, Adam Gase's eyes are going everywhere. Uh, like, except looking at Le'Veon Bell. Uh, they're giving Ty Montgomery the ball. So they, can't, <laughs> they, they can't get into the red zone. You buy him during his bye week because he's going to have, like, 12 straight games of production for you after that because not only do they play, like, Miami twice a year and the AFC East always seems to have pretty good schedules, but he's a guy who we know has the upside and pretty much the floor to catch, like, 80 balls and, like, get 250 carries. And I wouldn't let a slow first three games and first four games because he gets a bye. I wouldn't let that get in the way of thinking that he's still a top 10 running back this season. Yeah, I, I like that. And, and the point that you brought up the other time too is just the fact that like he has been away for so long. So it's possible that they kind of ease him into a workload. I'm really surprised they didn't let him get any run whatsoever with, um, with the team during preseason because they had Donald on the field for so many drives. So Ty Montgomery looked really good out there. Dude, he looked really good and they used him. They used him. Maybe like they're going to use Le'Veon Bell, but I, I think the fact that they use Ty Montgomery so heavily and they use him exactly how they want to use Bell, I feel like he's going to actually have a role in this offense. Like I really think that Adam Gase has taken a liking to Ty Montgomery. And if we see like a split in the first week where it's like 
16, 17 touches Bell and, you know, eight or nine touches for Ty Montgomery, that wouldn't, you know, uh, that would not surprise me at all because, you know, Bell still has to get his win back in the man. He's not going to be at like 100% NFL game speed for a couple weeks. Um, he's going to need to get those sprints in. He's going to need to take those hits before he's um, back into what, I mean, he hasn't been on the fucking field for 600 days now, you know? So uh, yeah, speaking about hits, did you listen to his album? <laughs> oh, I'm so pissed right now. Uh, I have never listened to a single thing that Le'Veon Bell has ever uh, has ever put out musically. Uh, I can imagine it's probably it the worst thing that would hit my fucking eardrums of all time. Yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. It's almost as bad as listening to me like 40 minutes into an episode. Listen to what? It's almost as bad as listening to me 40 minutes into an episode. <laughs> oh, I thought you said Big Bang Theory. I was like, let's fucking go. I, hate, I, <laughs> I agree with that too. <laughs> I don't understand how people like it, but that's uh, not the fucking point of this episode. That is our list of sell high, buy low, guys. I think we fucking hit that on the head, to be honest. I think that was a, I think that was a fantastic go episode, and I think these are guys that you need to keep on your radar because you can't just let go of guys early on. You can't give up on guys, and you can't forget about guys if they do start slow on other teams. These are guys that you should have – written down somewhere, right in your fucking notepads right now on your phone. Don't forget about these guys. Then in four to five weeks when we come back and we fucking predicted exactly what's going to happen, these are the toughest episodes because you try to predict four or five months in advance or four or five weeks in advance and they always end up being like horribly wrong. But I think I think we did well on this one. Uh, if you guys agree with that, we would appreciate a thumbs up and uh, subscribe if you're new to the channel, of course. Throughout the year, we will be on Patreon if you want all of your questions answered. Obviously, there are going to be a lot of comments down below. We can't get around to all of them. We try our best, but on patreon.com slash BDGE, you will get weekly rankings. You will get a private live stream helping you answer your sit-star questions. You will get a community forum in which myself, Noah, Snacks, and Animal will be helping answering your fantasy football questions. And you will get a waiver wire article. Uh, we are not doing a video this year for the waiver wire. That will only be an exclusive article on Big Dog's Patreon. So that is where you can get all the in-season exclusive content. Patreon.com slash BDGE. Go follow our asses on Twitter, and we will see you there. We'll see you on uh, next Thursday's video, next Wednesday's video. Enjoy week one's games. Football is fun. <laughs>